So we talked before about how the economy is uh, most efficient when it's in equilibrium. So the quantity demanded is equal to the quantity supplied. So consumers and producers are both all able to produce and sell and then purchase and use all the goods that they find valuable at that price. Also, the consumer surplus and the producer surplus are maximized. Now, even though it's maximized, we have the greatest economic surplus for all, all parties in the economy, individuals can still make themselves better off. So consumers can make themselves better off and producers can make themselves better off. But they can only do this by making someone else worse off. So sometimes we have groups of producers or groups of consumers that get together and lobby the government to get certain laws or regulations passed to help them out. It ends up making them better off and it ends up making other people worse off. So we talked about agricultural subsidies where farmers, so these markets, the producers, are able to capture some producer surplus by setting a price floor above the equilibrium price. They end up receiving more money um, at a higher price for the crops they sell increasing their producer surplus, and decreasing the consumer surplus of the market. So we saw that they make themselves better off at the expense of consumers, while at the same time, they, or they um, cause dead weight loss. So there's some surplus that's completely lost to the economy because um, of transactions that did not take place. We also looked at minimum wage laws. So minimum wage laws, although they're a way in theory, to help people with, um, with low skills that earn low wages, help them earn you know, more money so they're able to support their family, support themselves, live a decent life. It also comes with some negative side effects. It moves us out of equilibrium. We can think of the labor market just like the market for products. <clears throat> so we have here the supply of workers. So this, um, if you look at the labor market, the workers are like the firm. They're like selling the products. They're selling their labor to companies. And the demand is the companies that pay workers. So we set this minimum wage above the equilibrium wage. And remember, if we set the minimum wage below the equilibrium wage, that's not going to do anything. So when you set a minimum wage, you set a price floor for agricultural products, it's going to be above equilibrium. So it'll move the price up out of equilibrium. That ends up decreasing the quantity of labor um, demanded. So the number of workers that firms are willing to hire is going to go down because it's now more expensive to pay them. And the quantity of labor is going to increase. So the number of people that are willing to work at this higher wage is going to increase. So we end up with a surplus of labor, the difference between L2 and L3, of people that want to work, but they aren't able to work because firms can't afford to pay these workers at this higher wage. So now we look at this L1, which was the number of workers in equilibrium, and L2, the number that are able to be hired um, with the minimum wage. The difference between those two, the area of these two triangles, is the deadweight loss. So that's the amount of economic surplus that's lost because these people are unable to um, to find jobs in the labor market. Um, there's obviously some downsides to not being able to find a job. Being out of work for a while makes it more difficult to re-enter the labor market. You have those gaps in your employment. Um, you're not able to build skills to show employers, like to prove to future employers that you have uh, the willingness and ability to hold down a job and build these skills over time. So um, in essence, you think of it as like moving the lowest rung on the ladder. Everyone that, that's able to climb up, able to start at that second rung, is better off. But everyone at that bottom part, of the bottom rung, where the bottom rung was, is now worse off because they're unable to, to begin to climb. Um, I did mention last time the Carter Kruger study, which found much lower reductions in um, job losses due to minimum wage in New Jersey from their increase 
uh, maybe about 20 years ago now. Um, other studies have found much larger increases in unemployment. Um, but as I mentioned, all of those studies had problems with finding good data. Um, that's pretty common in economics to struggle to get decent data. So we do the best of what we have. Well, in this case, it makes it extremely difficult to try to tease out what the actual effects are. We can get magnitude, or not magnitudes, we can get the direction of changes, but it's difficult to estimate the magnitudes. Just like you're talking about with the very basic supply and demand curves and moving them in equilibrium, pretty easy to tell it's going to the main curve is going to shift to the left or the right, and what that's going to do to price. More difficult to estimate what exactly it's going to do to price. Okay. So now let's look at the economic effect of the price ceiling with the rent control. So let's look at the market without rent control. The equilibrium price in this market is $2,500 a month. And at that price, 2 million apartments are rented per month. So in absence of any, any uh, rent control, that's what the market looks like. So let's, suggest, or let's pretend renters um, get together, they form enough of an interest group that they can pressure the government to put, some rent, put a rent control um, in effect. So we put the ceiling I'd say $1,500 a month, what happens? Well, at that price, for, or, landlords are only willing and able to provide uh, 1.9 million apartments. So the marginal cost of these apartments is above the price they're going to receive, so they're not going to be able to supply them to the market. It's only so long you can lose money before you have to exit the market. Well, at the same time, we end up with 2.1 million markets demanded by consumers. Now, there's lower prices, more people are willing and able to buy apartments. You have fewer people living with roommates and with friends, they'll rent their own apartment. Maybe some people are willing to keep second apartments because um, one example is the former mayor of New York, when they had rent control, had four different apartments because they were so cheap. So we end up with a shortage of apartments. So the difference between the quantity demanded here, the 2.1 million, and the quality supply, 1.9 million. So what? 0.2 million, 200,000 um, apartments is the shortage. Obviously, this 2,500 rent per month in equilibrium, it's going to be a place like DC, New York City, not Loretta, right? You guys aren't paying that kind of price to live around here? I hope not. Yeah. So let's go back originally. The first one. The producer surplus in equilibrium is everything below the price and above the supply curve. So this whole area right here. The consumer surplus is above the price and below the demand curve. So that triangle right there. Again, in this situation, there's no deadly loss or any equilibrium, so we maximize both producer and consumer surplus. But now with rent control, you've got this price of $1,500 a month for rent. This rectangle A right here used to be producer surplus. It used to go to the landlord. Now it's been transferred to consumers. So you have A, and you have this portion up here of the previous consumer surplus. They're both consumer surplus. So those are both captured by renters. This little area down here is still captured by producers. So they still get this producer surplus below the place and above the supply curve. B and C here, what are these? Dead weight loss. These are transactions that used to occur up to 2 million but are now no longer occurring because of the lower price, because of the shortage we now have. So B, which did go to consumers before, to go to the renters in this case, that's now lost. And C, which went to producers, the landlords, that's now lost. So the economy overall is that much less efficient. 
But consumers, the renters, are made better off because the area of A is greater than the area of B. So in essence, what we have is renters are able to capture some of the producer surplus from landlords, make themselves better off at the expense of both the landlords, who have less producer surplus, and those consumers or renters that would be purchasing those right there, those 200,000 apartments. Okay, so the direct effect of rent control is a shortage of housing. Because we have this artificially low price, more people are willing and able to, um, to rent apartments, but it's more difficult for landlords um, to be able to afford to actually put these apartments up for rent. So we end up with this shortage. But we also get some indirect results from rent control. So the first, you'll get discrimination based on non-price methods of rationing goods. You kind of touched on this early in class. Um, how the market uses the price to ration goods. When price goes up, it encourages people to consume less. When it goes down, it encourages them to consume more. But there's other ways to ration goods. So they'll use non-price methods. They'll use other things besides increasing the price in order to determine who gets the apartments they're renting. So they could use legal or ethical ways, um, things like how loud the tenant is, um, they could call the previous landlords and see, like, and get recommendations from them, like, were they good to rent to, were they bad to rent to. Um, look at things like how much they party or whether they have weird smells from their cooking. Um, it could also be illegal things or unethical things, things like race, religion, age, um, protected classes in the United States. And they could also use personal connections to give us away. So it could be um, give it to friends, um, people they know through work, things like that. So instead of using price to ration the number of apartments and figure out who gets apartments, instead of giving it to who values them the most, we end up using other methods. Some good, or at least neutral, some bad. We, then, we also get an inefficient use of housing. Like I mentioned, the New York City mayor that had four apartments. Um, you get old couples and four bedroom houses that they raise their kids in. Over your lifetime, you need different size housing to accommodate your needs as your family grows and shrinks. So say a husband and wife, they have a bunch of kids. They need a four bedroom place to take care of those bunch of kids so they all have, they have enough room to sleep in. Um, but then those kids grow up, they move out, and it's just that old couple. They're in a rent control house, they're paying their apartment, and they're paying like three fifty a month. When to get a, a one or two bedroom place that'd be efficient for their needs, that would cost them like thousand dollars. They'd be crazy to do that to pay extra money to get a smaller place. So what they do is they stay in this large apartment, and then you have larger families needing to rent smaller apartments. Yeah, so it encourages people to remain in apartments that no longer meet their needs because the price is artificially low. Again, it would be crazy for them, for that old couple, to you know pay three, four times the rent they're paying to get a smaller place. So you can't blame them for that. It also benefits long-term renters over newcomers. So think of New York City as an example of a place of rent control. A lot of young people move there because that's where the jobs are, especially the high-paying jobs. But it ends up being very difficult to move to New York City, end up living with like three, four roommates because there's a shortage of housing. And you've got people, long-term people, who maybe they would retire and move out of the city um, because they no longer need to live there for work, but are staying there because it's so cheap, because they have these rents that they locked in back in, say, the 60s. And if your rent was frozen in 1960, it would be super low. If it was frozen in 2010, it's going to be much higher. So these people that live there for a long time continue to live there, even if they might not want to live there anymore, because the price is so good they can't eat it. 
It also decreases investment in housing. Um, obviously, if you can't get returns from the rent to satisfy the cost of you know, building and maintaining an apartment building, you're not going to build and maintain that apartment building. Um, if the cost of, um, <clears throat> oh, I'll save that for the next one. Usually rent control has a card out for uh, luxury apartments above a certain price. Um, and you guys see that show like, I think it's on Bravo, it's like New York million dollar listings. Like they try to sell those super expensive apartments. That's basically what you end up with, is you end up with a stagnating investment in like affordable apartments, like normal price apartments. But then you have these super luxury ones that don't, uh, that aren't under rent control. So we have a lot of investment in those because those are the only ones where you can actually recoup the money you're putting into it. So we end up with more investment in unaffordable, super luxury places instead of in low and mid-level apartments. Additionally, um, not just will um, landlords be hesitant to invest in new housing. Also, sometimes they'll convert existing properties to office space if it's convenient. Um, office rentals aren't covered under rent control, so they're able to price them at the market price. So they'll end up being higher than the, than the rent control price. So they'll be able to afford upkeep on the places. And the new investment in properties will be in building new office spaces instead of um, new, new apartments for people. So in places with rent control, New York City being like the best example, there was something, this is probably like five, six years old, but they, there were like seven, 12 percent of of like office spaces of those rentals were vacant. Meanwhile, there is a shortage of housing for people to live in. So this basically incentivizing people that own properties to go into um, go into office space instead of residential spaces helps encourage a shortage in housing. And then finally, the quality of housing out there deteriorates. So the prices of rent are staying the same, but the prices of everything else, inflation, the economy overall is increasing over this time. So the goods and services you need to be able to keep up apartments, so paying for, for a plumber to come in and fix a sink, um, putting a new roof on, the cost of all these are going to increase while the rent you're receiving is going to stay the same. So. Rather than lose money, what the landlords tend to do is use cheaper materials, again, because that's all they can afford. They make repairs less often. And we see the quality of these places deteriorate. So we have lower and lower quality apartments that people are actually living in. Eventually, oftentimes, the landlords, the owners of these properties can't afford the repairs. It's become, because of how little money they're taking in, they actually can't afford to pay for someone to come in and fix these things. So rather than lose money, a lot of them abandon the apartments. And New York City has tons and tons of abandoned properties that landlords just walked away from because there was no way for them to be able to afford the, the upkeep on. Again, this further decreases supply in the long run. So what we have initially is a policy that's trying to help renters, trying to help them um, get a more affordable place. And what we end up with is something that ends up making it much harder for renters to find an apartment, especially for newer renters. The older people that are locked in, they, it's great for them. They're paying much lower prices than they would on the market, but everyone else is made worse off. Oh yeah, this was an article like a year or so ago Rent regulations have the exact same negative consequences as skeptics predicted. 
The landlords couldn't pass along renovation costs, they stopped doing renovations. And this shouldn't be a surprise. Now, um, pulling out our supply and demand graph that you guys are tired of by now. Here's our market for apartments in equilibrium. Rather than rent control, moving the market out of equilibrium and causing a shortage, what's something we can do to lower the cost of housing? Just by shifting supply and demand curves. Create more housing. Create more housing. Increase the supply. We've just lowered the price and increased the quantity that people can <coughs> purchase. So some of the ways you can increase the supply. You guys have any ideas? One is zoning, make it easier for people to be able to build apartments. Um, a lot of areas have, have zoning rules that prevent like multifamily apartments or apartments of a certain size. So those limit the scope, limit the ability to uh, build big apartment buildings. Um, it may make sense in, in like a suburb where you just have like a whole bunch of houses. Maybe they don't want a 15 story apartment building right next door. So very different for the neighborhood. But if we're looking in like a lot of downtown areas and cities in New York City, San Francisco, a lot of these, these large cities, very difficult to build new housing. And when you can build new housing, it's very limited. Things like that. Then you could do like more boring stuff, like tax breaks for people that build housing, um, subsidies to build housing, other things that are cheap or uh, I guess simple that focuses on expanding the supply. So, in Jurassic Park, Jeff Goldblum says, life finds a way. Um, in the same way, in the same vein, markets find a way. And there's mutually beneficial exchanges out there. People are going to try to do them. So, buyers and sellers, black markets are when buyers and sellers go outside of legal markets in order to engage in these transactions. Now, we can be things like drugs. It can be renting an apartment above the rent control price. Anything where they don't have the legal protection of government is called a black market. So normal government or normal markets, someone rips you off, someone gives you a low quality good, someone reneges on a deal, you have the government to go to. You say, hey, we have this contract. Hey, this good caused me damage when I used it. My my Samsung blew up in my ear. And then you can be you know, made whole. You can get, get money back to compensate you for that. A black market, these protections the government don't exist. So for instance, if you look at that, um, look at the market of rent control, tenants can offer their potential landlords uh, something on the side. They can bribe them or they can say maybe they pay their rent, the rent control rate, with a check, and then they pay another thousand bucks in cash, uh, paying like the equilibrium price. Technically, this is considered the black market. Additionally, you have peer to peer rental sites, so things like Airbnb, where people rent out um, their apartments or rooms in their apartment. Technically, what this does, it ends up raising the price. So, we end because the um, Airbnb. Um, VRBO, the vacation site, lets them get around rent controls because you can charge, end up charging a higher price because you're selling it for fewer nights. But you can get longer term rentals from these places as well. And it ends up being at a higher price than rent control. So it's more, more close to the market price. There's also um, there's some 
peer-to-peer -peer rental sites where people, they own a car but they're not using it during the day, they can rent it to people. It matched like they do on Airbnb or on Uber. Rent it to people and then you know, that person uses the car for the day. So they're able to like, get money from these assets they own that aren't being used. So it's kind of a cool way to think about the future of people. So like I drove up here this morning, my car's gonna sit in the parking lot all day. To be able to rent it to say a student or someone who lives in the right that doesn't have a car, they can rent that. I can make some money from having this car that just sits there. And it's actually being used. The same way people go out of town for a while, they can rent out their house on Airbnb. Actually make some money from having this asset that they're not using. So in the future, we may not, people may not even own things as often. People may not, there may only be like a small group of people that own cars, and if you want a car, you just rent it from one of them instead of spending all your money buying one. Okay. So when government enacts price controls, people who own products, they find their way around it, even in the Soviet Union, even under central planning where there were no markets that were supposed to take place, these markets still developed. There were still, actually, there were some cool things in the Soviet Union where um, the Central Planning Board would go to factories and say, these are your raw materials, this is what you're going to use, the production process, you need to make this many, like this is your output for the month, go. And they might not have enough, they might have too much. So what these factory owners would do is create a black market trading with each other stuff they needed, stuff they had left over that they didn't need. And it created somewhat of a market. So these peer-to-peer -peer rental sites like Airbnb and uh, markets where there's rent control, they help alleviate some of the dead weight loss. So we have additional apartments being rented, um, even if it's just short-term rooms in someone's place, people are still able to find a place to live. Um, so we're reducing the dead weight loss. We're increasing the consumer and producer surplus in these cases, but the buyers and sellers lose valuable legal protections. Markets with legal protections are always much better than markets without legal protection. Someone goes back on a deal, someone gives you something super low quality, um, there's no recourse to hold them accountable for. We talked before about how competitive pressures force businesses to meet consumers' needs better. Um, without these legal protections, consumer gets hurt or they get a low quality product, well, they're shit out of luck. So now we've removed this incentive for, um, for producers to offer higher quality goods and services. So these market forces that make things better break down when there's no legal protection. Bobby talking about becoming a drug dealer. So let's look at the market for drugs. It's a pretty big example of a black market. The black markets can result from evasion of price controls, evasion of taxes. So um, during the colonial period in the United States, we had black markets in um, sugar, molasses, and rum, tea, a lot of other things to get around high taxes the British government put on those products. Um, but a large one is legal prohibition, where the government says you cannot purchase these products, you cannot sell these products. So what happens with black markets? It results in more defective products. Again, there's less quality control because there's no one to go to um, if you get a poor product. You can't complain to good housekeeping. You can't complain to the Better Business Bureau. What do I discuss? The Ungrateful Biatch Hotline. You can't call that. There's no trade association. Nothing to help 
ensure and encourage high quality stuff. You end up with higher profits in black markets because there's fewer, there's fewer sellers in the market. And you end up with violence and solve disputes. In very short order, um, these organizations result in violence instead of, again, using the court system. So, great example, market for drugs. So, what are some of the reasons drugs are illegal? Well, first they want to reduce drug use. They're making it illegal. Because they believe it's harmful to the users that use drugs. They want to reduce the money that people spend on drugs. Because they think that's, you know, if drugs are a bad thing, spending money on that's a bad thing, you could be spending money on something good. Uh, there's also crime associated with drugs. Again, this is largely because they're illegal. But while they're illegal, there's crime associated with it. So that's another reason people that support prohibition of drugs. That's one, you know, one of the reasons they get for it. So drug prohibition obviously affects people's demand for drugs. How does this? How do they affect people's demand for drugs? Any ideas? Yeah, once you're a user, this really probably won't go, probably won't stop you. But for the marginal person trying to stop if they want to do drugs or not, being illegal does increase the cost. It, it um, makes these societal norms against drugs and seen as something illegal. Um, there's punishment and penalties, so we're increasing the cost of doing drugs. Not just you have to pay probably a higher price now if it's illegal, but you also have the chance of being arrested, being thrown in jail, having professional consequences if you get caught using drugs. And finally, respect for law, as much as that exists, discourages drug use. Because we now made it illegal, if you're someone who res you know, respects the law, um, you'll be less likely to use drugs. There's also some effects on the supply side of the market. So there's no legal enforcement of contracts. So if you're building a business, it doesn't make sense to get into the business of selling drugs unless you're you know, willing to deal with violence in order to settle your disputes. Um, if you're involved in the supply side of the market for drugs, you have to invade law enforcement. So anytime you transport it, sell it, um, grow it, um, you've got to try to avoid law enforcement. You have to hide it somehow. That makes it more difficult and ends up costing you money trying to avoid that. Um, maybe there's, you have to engage in bribing officials, law enforcement or politicians. That ends up being costly. You have to compensate your employees for risk. There's serious risk associated between arrest and between violence that may occur. Um, so you have to pay your employees higher wages for that. People make more money transporting and selling cocaine now than they did when Sears and Roebuck offered it for sale. Yeah, you can look at like old ads for like Sears in like the twenties before they like banned cocaine and heroin, and they had little little injection kits for heroin. They had little little things like keep your cocaine and like the mirror. It's really really weird to see like these old ads like advertising. So the U.S. drug policy is pretty much supply-side focused. It tries to make it more difficult to sell drugs and to bring them into the country. So if you're in the, in the business of drugs, sale and importation, more difficult. Harsh sentences for drug dealers. And the goal is to decrease the supply of drugs that will drive up the price. Once you drive up that price, there's a lower quantity being demanded by consumers. So let's look at what market for one particular drug, market for crystal meth. Do you think demand's gonna be elastic or inelastic? Inelastic. 
It'll ask it. Why? People aren't going to be very responsive to change in price because there's not a lot of things, not a lot of substitutes for crystal meth. Yeah. And, and it's like, you know, it's physically hit to we look at the market for crystal meth. We have a very inelastic demand. A large change in price only leads to a small change in quantity demand. So if we decrease the supply, say um, our drug policy is working, the war on drugs is working, we're decreasing the supply, crystal meth. We're increasing the price substantially from equilibrium to this new price, but the quantity demand is only decreasing by a little bit. So crystal meth, the determining factors um, for users the people that enjoy crystal meth, that is high utility, they get a lot of enjoyment out of it. And there's a lack of sub substitutes because of their addiction. Once you start to get physically addicted to something, obviously, um, you need to do, do that to satisfy your addiction. You can't do something else. Price is going to be a lot less of a factor in your choice to do that. So non-addicts, like I mentioned, will have less usage of crystal meth. It's now more expensive, um, less likely to get into this market. But once you're someone that's a consumer, you're already involved in this market, you've developed maybe a physical addiction, or at least you're getting a lot of utility from this. You're really enjoying the high you get from crystal meth. Um, you're going to keep, keep, pur keep purchasing it. So what the policy does is it increases the cost for drug addicts, and this implies that more crime will be caused by people um, trying to fulfill their addiction. Because they're not sensitive to price, you're still selling, or they're still selling a lot of crystal meth. People that are addicted to it are still using a lot of crystal meth, but now they're paying a much higher price for it. Now dealers are going to sell fewer drugs, not by a lot, but by a little, but they're going to get a much higher price for each unit being sold. Again, because this is very inelastic demand, they get this much higher price. So they're going to end up with a lot more total revenue under prohibition than they will if we weren't fighting the war on drugs in this case. So they're seeing a much higher increase in price, only a small decrease <coughs> in the quality demand. So huge increase in total revenue in this case. So under prohibition, the dealers that aren't arrested, that are able to keep working, they're going to be made a lot better off than they would under like a similar free market. Or even if it was a black market with apple war on drugs going on. Basically, what I just said, sorry. So, the policy war on drugs ends up with unintended consequences. So, it ends up actually promoting crime. First of all, there's no arbiter, there's no impartial um, judge, Judy, or that dude from the People's Court, or a regular court to, um, to settle disputes. So, the easy way to do that ends up doing it through violence. You have rivals that are willing to engage in turf battles. So they'll engage in violence with each other to fight over market share. Instead of competing with each other, like we see in a typical market where we have the protection of law, without the protection of law, it would be much easier to just engage in violence to do that. And also, the black market attracts what we call high time preference individuals. So if you have a high time preference, that means that you, um, you want immediate gratification. Whereas if you have a low time preference, you're willing to wait for you know, whatever good thing. You're willing to sacrifice in the short term for good things in the long term. So I admit like high quality product and willing to wait for higher quality to come in instead of just taking the first day. Yeah. Yeah, so these are people, they want instant gratification, they're willing to take a lot of risks. 
They enjoy taking risks. It also encourages the bribery and the corruption of government officials who get involved in prohibition. There's also a welfare effect on users. So it decreases the quality of the drugs that they're using. There's no quality control. And it's, there's a lot less consistency of the potency of drugs. Now, prohibition increases the potency per unit. So if you're, you're trying to sell drugs, you're trying to transport drugs, you want them as potent as possible. So it's in as small of a, uh, the small of the size as possible. So it's easier to conceal. Um, I know no one here has ever drank before being 21. But before you're 21, most people drink liquor instead of beer because liquor comes in a smaller bottle, much easier to hide a fifth of liquor than a case of beer. There's also riskier consumption methods that people use in order to maximize their return on investment. Uh, they try to get like the best time possible. So they'll use riskier and riskier ways to do that. And because of the fixed cost of avoiding authorities, this incentivizes people to ship to more potent drugs. This is the Ouch Allen effect. We talked about um, we're going over the laws of demand. You've got that same fixed cost of avoiding authorities on all types of drugs. So it ends up incentivizing people to use more and more potent drugs. And there's also problems with the, um, the war on drugs. It ends up causing the domestic militarization of police. So police begin using, they use SWAT raids. Um, they use surplus military equipment. So like protective equipment, um, firearms, and even like you see local police departments with like Humvees. Now, yeah. uh, that affects something you can talk about. We well, more of a focus on a criminal justice class than an economics <laughs> class, but it's still something that happens. Oh yeah, and this is my example of trying not to sneak beer in, or switching to liquor. Most people. If they go to a football game, they want to bring in alcohol, they bring in a flask. This dude, I hate to like blur out his face, so it's kind of hard to see. This was in like August in like Europe, and he wore a giant parka. And he had like a case of beer hidden in like all the pockets throughout that. But it's like 80 degrees. Everyone's wearing shorts and a t-shirt, he's wearing a parka, and he's like all sweaty. So they knew something was up. And in the video, they literally just they just show them they just keep pulling out like beer after beer after beer. That's like a couple minutes long. You're gonna need to drink beer. I mean, I respect the hustle, but you're going to use more potent drugs or more potent alcohol because you've got this fixed cost. Trying to sneak and pass them, you get caught, you get kicked that's out. That's what that's what that is. It's what? Brand loyalty. Maybe it, it, yeah. It's really brand loyalty. He loved whatever kind of beer that is so much that he was willing to sneak that in instead of something safer. Okay. So the insights from the economic way of thinking about drug prohibition, treating the black market for drugs as a, as a market, it's not the nature of the product that causes problems in society. The violence, much of it is due to the black market itself, to having no legal recourse, no way to settle disputes. Not the actual drugs themselves, nothing about the drugs that's causing the violence that accompanies the industry. So other very different illegal products have similar problems when they're sold in the black market. Prostitution, gambling, alcohol during prohibition, all had violence accompanying it. We had turf battles of people trying to expand um, their market share in these illegal markets. We had violence to settle disputes between rival gangs and prohibition. And these disappeared. They didn't exist before. And they went away as soon as we ended prohibition. Anheuser-Busch doesn't conduct raids on cores. And we have legal stimulants with similar characteristics that aren't plagued by violence. So things that are that are pretty similar to illegal drugs. They're used, you know, people are given like prescriptions for them. They're created, sold, marketed all legally. There means a recourse if there's something wrong with it. 
we don't see these problems. We don't see um, really spot equality. We don't see them making them more and more potent. We don't see the violence going along with it. Here we have people celebrating their war on drugs. We did it. We saved the city. I'll look at the destruction they caused. All right. We'll end there for the class. Next time we'll pick up with the results of the price control in general.